an outstanding European physicist, Professor Paolo Giubilino. Paolo Giubilino really is an outstanding European physicist with the international acclaim. My old friend and colleague, that's why I'd like to say a few words of introduction about him. I first was introduced to him when he headed one of the four main experiments within CERN's Alice experiment. He was two times chosen as the spokesman of that outstanding international CERN experiment. After that, he participated in a contest and won and that uh, he was chosen the scientific supervisor of the International Fair Institute, facility for proton and ion research. Heavy ions and uh, protons in Dormstadt. At the same time, he headed the National Institute, Yangon's Center, ESE, and he has become the head of two outstanding institutions, the national one and the international one, FIRE and GSE. And he's working in this capacity for the fifth year quite successfully. Doing that, FIRE got a big impetus under his supervision and moves to its successful completion. And I'm happy about that because uh, he replaced me in the position of a scientific supervisor. And I'm glad to say that he is very good in command of those institutions. I'd like to say that uh, Paolo Giubilino is really a person who has huge merits before the science. He specializes in nuclear physics and the transition phase into the day's high temperature matters. This is what has been done during the experiments which are going to be held at fire facility. And really, he has a lot of uh, merits before his uh, Italian motherland. He got an award. Uh, uh, the, he was nominated as a commendatore, an Italian nomination. He is a laureate of America Fermi Prize and the European Physicist Prize, named after Ms. Meyer. I, as the Vice Director of the Nuclear Research Institute, pleased that uh, Paolo defended his PhD in Dubna, and he got his doctor's thesis and degree in the year 2000 in the city of Dubna. I may tell you that uh, you have to be looking forward to a very interesting lecture. And Paolo himself is a very pleasant person, a typical Italian, very lively, very talkative, verbose, with a good sense of humor, a good family man. Every weekend he goes to Rome from Darmstadt and spends his uh, vacations with his son. So this remarkable scientist and a very pleasant person will share with us some remarkable data about his specialty on such a project which he is heading. I wish you a very interesting lecture. Paolo, over to you. Audience, and therefore, uh, please do it well. I will you try my take best. The floor. I will try my best. Uh, thank you, Boris Yurievich. It's, it's always a pleasure to hear your words. And uh, let's go directly to the, to the presentation. Well, I will try to tell you something about what we call the universe in the lab. And, uh, and why? Because, you know, uh, nowadays... Uh, I to try to... Okay. Nowadays... Uh, there is a, a, a magic moment for science because there's been a major advance in our tools to understand the universe. You know that uh, 
humans have been looking at the universe for a long, long time, uh, looking at electromagnetic radiation coming from the universe. In recent times, so telescopes, radio telescopes more recently and so on. In recent times, uh, this has expanded enormously thanks to what is called multi-messenger astronomy. We now look at the neutrinos from the space in experiments like uh, the ice cube at, uh, at the uh, South Pole or the one at the Baikal Lake in, in Russia. Uh, we see the gravitational wave signals with detectors like LIGO and Virgo so that we can have not just the light, but a lot of information about what is going on in the universe. And then it comes the question how to understand what is happening up there and uh, what the processes are that determine how our universe is. And this is uh, suddenly one has to realize that this is actually nuclear physics. These are nuclear physics processes starting from the simple burning of our sun, which is a nuclear physics process, to the explosion of a supernova, to a, a merger of neutron stars. Those are all nuclear processes. So for that, we need theory and calculations that are done in uh, very sophisticated computer centers and with very sophisticated uh, theoretical tools by our scientists in both nuclear and uh, astrophysics, but also you need the data. And data come from experiments in the laboratory where you can study in, under controlled conditions the processes which are happening around the universe or which have happened in the history of the universe. So we have to always remember <coughs> Every atom in your body was built through generations and generations of stars. You create stars from uh, dust in space. The star has a certain life is evolution. Finally, it dies and again turns to dust. And again, you have another cycle. Cycle after cycle, we have the atoms of which we are made. There is a famous sentence, we are made of star stuff that is not <clears throat> a poetic statement. That's a correct scientific statement. Now, our understanding of what matter is made of um, has evolved dramatically through history. We went from a very old idea of uh, the nature being made of fire, air, water, and earth to the systematization by Mendeleev in the 19th century in the periodic table, which, by the way, we continue to populate nowadays in experiments, especially in my own laboratory and uh, in the uh, very famous uh, Ferro laboratory at, uh, in Dubna. Now, there's been a turning point, though, in this understanding of the universe. You know, the, and the difference is actually not so much uh, of uh, principle, but of method. At some point, scientists went from trying to understand nature through speculation to trying to understand nature through observations, but not only observations. This is the a picture of Galileo Galilei's telescope. And on the left is observations of the moon. Now, he did not invent the telescope, but he was the first person to think that even if you have an instrument between you and the object that you want to study, you will still obtain scientifically valid information about the structure of this object. And this now seems trivial. Everyone thinks I look into a microscope and I look at cells, I look into a telescope and I see things distant. That was not at all obvious. Actually, it was received with a lot of skepticism. The idea that one could have knowledge built 
beyond the human senses, built through an instrument that would allow us to make our senses more powerful. I mean, what do we do when we look at something? This is actually the fundamental experiment. You take light, for example, from a lamp, light hits an object, and then the scattered light reaches our eye and then is processed by our brain, which is the computer center. This is the way we traditionally have observed objects around us and gained knowledge about them. When you want to go beyond this, well, you will want to do two things typically, either to have more light, and we will see that that means to have more luminosity in your system, or you will want to have more sophisticated detector. Instead of having just your eye, you will have a microscope and, or a telescope and so on. But also, at some point, you will want to look at details which are smaller. How do you get to smaller details? Well, the light is a certain wavelength. You see it in this picture in the low, lower left. And uh, therefore, it has a certain resolving power, is, is uh, said. So you can see objects of a certain size, which is comparable at, at minimum with uh, the size of your wavelength. So if you want something smaller, for example, you want to look inside this object, well, you will need higher frequency, smaller wavelength. There is a physical law which tells you that for that you need higher energy. The energy of your photons, of your light, will have to be higher. Now, this means that your tool will have to be progressively of higher and higher energy. But then how do you understand then objects? Well, it, it, the first nuclear physics of the experiment was the experiment of Rutherford that had uh, uh, discovered the nucleus. What, what did he have to do? He wanted to understand if an atom was sort of a, like a cotton ball, a ball of cotton, uh, or a wall with, with the bricks, with uh, a general medium, which would be of positive charge, with electrons inside, which were negative, or something like a planetary system, like the solar system, with the, the nucleus in the middle and the electrons flying around. So what did he do? He took a, a box with a, a radioactive sourcing. They knew that, that, that the particles coming, they didn't know much about what these particles were, but they knew that when they would hit a little crystal that you see here, wouldn't meet the flash of light. So then they put, got, went to a dark room and put the source in a box of lead so that they would come out of, in, in line, aligned, and then put a very, very thin foil, very, very thin foil of gold. And then observe what was happening. And what happened was shocking. Because if you had a uniform wall against which you throw your, your uh, particles, you would see that all would get somewhat uh, deviated. Instead, what they observed was that some would just go straight through without having almost any deviation. Some would actually be bounced backwards as if they had hit something extremely hard and extremely heavy. This for them was a complete shock, but they were capable of interpreting it. If you think of that, that, that foil of gold is actually mostly empty, and there are the nuclei of the atoms, which occupy a very small piece, a part, portion of space, and they are heavy, and then the electrons, which are not heavy at all, which fly around, well, this is exactly what would happen, and though they were capable from a very simple observation like this to define what is the structure of an atom and discover the nucleus. From then on, so you see that the two things, you want to 
issue. Have higher and higher energy in order to look at smaller and smaller details. And you want to hit something with your projectile and then look at what happens with the detector. These uh, little crystals were the detector of Rutherford and this little source, what, what we call an accelerator. Since then, we have gone higher and higher energy, smaller and smaller details of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of the matter have been observed. And in that, we have been capable of basically uh, traveling, travel backwards in the history of the universe all the way to a few microseconds from the Big Bang. So we have now measurements that relate to the entire history of the universe. And that, of course, requires big systems and big data. I mean, individual detectors can weigh as much as a Eiffel Tower. Data which we produce are measured now in petabytes. So it's, a, it's big science, and it requires big machines. This is a picture of the accelerator at CERN. In, to the right, you see the Geneva airport. This is a 27 kilometer machine, which is 100 meters underground. Or uh, this is uh, the fair complex of accelerators, which is currently under construction in Darmstadt, and which is my laboratory. So it's the thing that I will be talking most about. Um, each of these facilities look similar in pictures, but they are very, very different in terms of optimization of what you are looking for, depending on what is the aspect of matter and of the universe that you want to understand, it will be a different type of accelerator, different type of detector that you will be using. So they are huge constructions. These are the num global numbers for, for FAIR. You see it's uh, 2 million cubic meters of earth to be moved, 600,000 cubic meters of concrete. This is like eight soccer stadiums, 65,000 tons of steel. So it's like nine Eiffel Towers. The, the overall construction is like building 5,000 homes. So this is a huge effort and it is not done by a country. These are always done by a joint effort of many countries which put together the resources and but especially their know-how what they know how to uh, do their technology the ability of their scientists and so on and this fair is built by nine international uh, shareholders people which countries which actually own the laboratory the ones in orange in this picture but it is used People participate in experiments and so on by all the ones in blue. You see that most of the world is participating. And in this, I must say, uh, Russia is not a participant, it's a leading player. I mean, uh, uh, not only is the second largest third holder, but a lot of the components and one entire accelerator are built in Russian laboratories. The academician Sharkov, who introduced me, has been the director of the laboratory just before me, been somehow the pusher of this uh, effort to, through successful start. And I, I got on a train which was already running. And uh, thanks to him and to other people preceding us. But you see from this picture how many uh, uh, laboratories in Russia are involved. This is a major participation. Why do we build it in Darmstadt? Well, because in Darmstadt there was a laboratory which is called GSI, uh, which was the reference laboratory for nuclear physics in Western Europe, one of the top laboratories. You see here some of the discoveries. For example, if you look at the table of the elements, you see this group of elements here at the bottom were all discovered at GSI, in particular, there exists a Darmstadtium from the city of Darmstadt where the laboratory is. There exists a Hassium from the uh, state of Hessen where the laboratory is. And similarly, if you look at the table of the isotopes here, number of neutrons or number of protons, the black ones are the stable ones and the other have all been discovered in 
uh, produced in laboratories around the world. All the red ones have been produced at uh, GSI, but there's many, many, many fundamental discoveries. On, on the left is the first thermodynamical picture of nuclear matter in which you see this is a caloric curve of nuclear matter. You heat nuclear matter um, by increasing the energy density. This down here is the energy density on the, uh, on the uh, horizontal axis. And on the left axis is the temperature. And you can see nuclei being heated. Then you get to a region where you have, are using the latent heat of the nuclear uh, interaction. And then finally, uh, fragments fly away uh, as a gas. So it's, it's really uh, very similar to the caloric curve of any material, but done then on a microscopic level. There are the most precise measurement uh, test of uh, time dilation, you know, the, uh, from the theory of relativity, uh, has been done at one of the storage rings, which is a the storage ring is a, an accelerator in which you keep particles circulating at a very, very high speed, a fraction of the speed of light, a large fraction of the speed of light. And then what you do in this case, you shine a laser in the direction of the motion or against the direction of the motion, and you measure the time of a, of a specific transition. And this uh, you, in a way, you can measure it with very high precision, the time dilation, the relativistic time dilation. Um, but also there's been lots of applications. There's been a, a, a fundamental innovation in cancer therapy. Uh, we're using uh, beams of nuclei. Actually, 440 patients were actually treated on campus at GSI before transferring to clinics outside. And why, what do we exploit? We exploit the fact that if you have um, a X, uh, gamma rays, uh, a lot of the energy is actually lost, uh, deposited in uh, uh, the healthy tissue, which is not what you don't want. Look at the picture up here, uh, up to the right of the of the uh, of the slide. Uh, the blue curve is what you do uh, in in terms versus the depth in the body uh, as energy deposition when you do use gamma rays. You see that a lot is spent in the tissue before you reach the tumor. With the nuclei, you can tune the energy so that most of the energy is actually deposited exactly, very precisely, uh, in the tumor. And this is a huge advantage, especially in the cases in which the healthy tissue around is particularly precious. For example, if you are uh, treating a cancer which is in the brain or in the spine or in the eye. So this is a technique which is now used widely to treat uh, cancers which are in dangerous positions. So if you look now at this uh, picture again, you see the one I've been telling you about is GSI, which is up on the left, while FAIR is the construction which is going on on the right of the panel. Seen more schematically, you see it here. In blue is the GSI area, where you have a series of accelerators and of so-called storage rings, which are like the one I just showed you before, accelerators where you keep particles circulating over and over again so that you can do very precise measurements. On the right, in red, is the fair <clears throat> facility with a number of different accelerators. I was telling you one is entirely built in Russia, which is the CR down here. <clears throat> and there are, but there are very many components. For example, all the uh, quadruples, which is one type of, of magnets for this big accelerator up here, which is called CIS-100, which is the, the biggest one, are also built in Russia and many others. What will FAIR do compared to GSI? Well, we'll give, have from 100 to 10,000 times more particles. Why is that interesting? Well, you want, if, if you think back at the example I was giving before, what are we doing? We are like shedding light on an object and seeing with our detectors what a 
the structure of the object is. Imagine you are in a dark room and you have a very faint light that will only let you see very coarse details of what you have around. If you want to see clearly, you want to have more light. For us, that means more intensity, more particles. And this is what will enormously increase in fair compared to GSI. Moreover, there will be more energy and there will be anti-proton beams. Anti-matter is a marvelous instrument to understand the structure of matter itself. And this will be done in a dedicated experiment called PANDA, which will study the structure of protons and neutrons and other fundamental particles by using as a tool the anti-protons. So, new high intensity beams, which will allow to see details, but also to produce very rare nuclei. And we will see in a moment why that is interesting. This will be produced by accelerating nuclei like uranium in the CIS-100, shipping them to a target a, a, where they will produce very many secondary so-called so nuclei. We'll see in a moment why this is interesting, but this, here you see that there is a system which is called the fragment separator, which will allow you to choose the, exactly the most interesting ones and then to accumulate them and study them in detail in the CR and the HDSR. And all this wealth of, of potential, this is like saying we, have, we build a major new rocket. And then you put satellite, you use it to put satellites in orbit. Those are the experiments. Here, so with the rocket are all these accelerators. The satellites are the experiments which are structured in four so-called pillars. Uh, Panda, I already mentioned, we study the structure of hadrons, use the antiprotons. Nustar, which studies the structure of nuclei, but in the all uh, types of astrophysical reactions, the ones I was mentioning in the beginning. CBM, which studies uh, nuclear matter when it is extremely dense and hot. Imagine what is this relevant for? Well, to understand neutral stars and neutron star mergers. And finally, APA, which is where we study plasma physics. And you will see again why this is interesting, atomic physics, but also material research, radiation biology, and cancer therapy, as we were mentioned, talking before. So this is some, these are some of the key questions which we need to answer about our universe. So we've talked before about the periodic table of the elements. And if you would have looked at the periodic table of the elements a few instants after the Big Bang, it would have looked pretty empty. Only very few light elements are produced at the time of the Big Bang. Everything else is produced in a number of processes along the history of the universe. You can see them in the, in the top left picture here, the burning of stars. For example, from hydrogen produces helium and then on to carbon and oxygen. The explosions of novae, supernovae, and finally, the neutron star mergers. All those are so-called nucleosynthesis sites. I mean, uh, places in the universe where you create nuclei. And what we will do, we will use the beam of, of uh, uh, nuclei, make lots of fragments. You see, this is a picture of all those little fragments. We can select with the fragment separator the most interesting ones to understand some of, the, of these processes and then study in different types of experiments. And uh, I just give you some examples. There's many, many, many such processes, but we are made of carbon and oxygen. And already in his Nobel lecture in 1983, Fowler was indicating as one of the key things that one has to understand is the process by which stars in the late part of their life, having burned hydrogen into helium, burn helium into carbon, and then 
carbon plus helium into oxygen. So we know the concept, but then how much carbon, how much helium, uh, oxygen, those are the building blocks of life. And that we will be measuring at FAIR. It's a, it's a process that in massive stars takes place when they are old, they are red, and uh, that we will be producing in the laboratory and study precisely. We get neutrinos from the sun. This is a beautiful messenger of what is happening in the burning of the sun. And then we can ask ourselves the question, how has the sun been shining along its history? Well, there is a process which the neutrinos which come from the sun induce in a uh, specific atom, pallium, in, a, in which can be found in a mineral, laurentite. And the, if you measure precisely the probability that a solar neutrino will trigger a transition uh, from be, between the two nuclei, thallium and lead, then you can measure how much you have in your mineral, and that will tell you uh, how much the sun has been shining along in, this, uh, in the last millions of years. You can have a very precise measurement, but you have to measure the prob how probable it is for the neutrino which comes from the sun to make this happen. Well, we will measure it at FAIR. You all have seen in the news the fact that finally a neutron star merger has been observed, and uh, it's been observed first through the uh, gravitational waves, and then the light which has been emitted afterwards. And you see up there in the right, the comparison between the measurements and the prediction of seven years before by a group of theoretical physicists. Well, these theoretical physicists are from our laboratory. Why were they calculating these things? Well, and actually they invented the name Kilonova even, because we will be able to reproduce in the laboratory, all of these process, the processes which govern this sequence of events, the structure of the matter in a neutron star, in experiments like others and CVM, then the structure of matter, how it evolves when the two, when the two neutron stars merge, density increases, temperature increases, how matter behaves in this extreme electromagnetic field. And then from that, you don't produce the ordinary nuclei. You produce very exotic nuclei that then decay to populate the periodic table as we know it. And this you will measure in the, in the Mustard experiment. So with the four pillars that I was telling you before, we actually address the whole history of a neutron star merger from the neutron stars alone to the production of gold and platinum, which is done at the end. That is actually our, so all the gold we have comes from neutron star mergers. Uh, and uh, so imagine you look at a gold object near you that has come from the merger of two neutron stars somewhere in the universe a long time ago. And uh, this we can reproduce in the laboratory the whole story. Uh, if you look, unfortunately, there, this was a nice image which is, does not appear, so we skip it. Um, the temperatures that one can have and the density that one can have in the neutron star and then in the neutron star merger can be reproduced, you see down here, in the collision of two nuclei in fair that come to densities and temperatures which are in the same range. So if you look at the um, phase diagram of, of matter, for example, of any material, water, you will always find a change in pressure and temperature. You address different 
behaviors in different phases. You have ice, you have liquid water, you have vapor. And the only way to understand how each one of them behaves is by directly studying them in that phase. You don't learn much from about ice studying vapor. And similarly, in the phase diagram of strongly interacting matter, where you have the density and the temperature again, you have down here neutron stars, you have down here nuclei. The up here is the early universe, is the Big Bang. And what we will be studying as fair is this region in red, neutron stars and the transition from nuclei to plasmas of, of, uh, of quarks and gluons. But there's more, there's many more subjects. Think of the interior of planets. We have all these beautiful pictures which we take with uh, uh, satellites in space. And we know a lot about the exterior of the planet and the surface. But what do we know about the interior, even our own Earth? We don't know, we don't know very much about how it works inside. So it is important to produce plasmas, high density materials similar to in conditions to the, those inside the planets to actually understand how they work. And this will be done at FAIR. But also uh, there is a, a different way of thinking of the universe about the universe as a, an exploration territory. Um, now, space missions are becoming longer and longer. We want to go to uh, Mars. We want to make colonies. Well, then we have to remember that in space, uh, there is uh, uh, radiation coming from uh, distant sources that constantly hits the materials and the humans. So on a Mars mission, the risk of cancer, for example, starts to be considerable. Um, the risk of uh, uh, errors in your computers becomes considerable. <clears throat> so you have to study that, understand how it works, and on the basis of that, find the mitigation methods and the, how to handle it in order to have successful long missions in space. Actually, we are the laboratory which has been chosen by the European Space Agency for their ground measurements. But also you want to understand the other effects of the, of the cosmic rays. For example, how the role they played in the emergence of life on Earth. So what you can do is to take grains that mimic the astrophysical ice grains that you find in space, expose them to radiation like they receive in space, and see if, they, if you actually produce um, molecules which can be the basis of life. And indeed, you do. This is something which is an active subject of study right now already. Uh, you do produce amino acids and other building blocks for life. So you see, you get the whole picture from the Big Bang all the way <clears throat> to the, through the history of the universe, to how you produce the heavy elements, gold and platinum, to how you produce the building blocks of life, the carbon and oxygen, and finally how cosmic rays can affect the creation of life or damage and for that allows you to produce, um, uh, so, sorry, to do this, you need uh, advanced technologies. I told you already before, you need uh, very powerful computer systems, but then these use a lot of energy. And so you want to make them energy efficient. We made uh, fundamental advances in so-called green IT, this blue, uh, the symbol up there is the blue blue angle, which is a, a certificate for uh, eco-friendliness of the system. This is the only computer center ever which has it. You develop uh, technologies for uh, accelerators, uh, but uh, also uh, for more uh, sophisticated things like uh, the development of nuclear clocks, which are the future of clocks. Um, you, you, we have now, as a reference, atomic clocks. But the, the, to get the stability you need for, for example, going from the GPS, your GPS that you have in your cell phone 
is has a precision which is determined by the precision of an atomic clock. If you want to go from meters to centimeters, for example, to allow a system that can be used to automatically land an airplane or to have a car self-driving, you need 100 times more precision. You need a nuclear clock. But you also need uh, to face new challenges for uh, the medical applications. You want to be able to treat cancers which are moving, like in a lung, or to use your particle, your beams uh, as a scalpel, for example, to uh, intervene for uh, heart arrhythmias. And all these are fascinating uh, subjects of development which will come up in the future. But also, since you have such a powerful system, you can use it uh, to face uh, global emergencies. We are now uh, working, the, our, several of our groups in uh, material science, but especially in biophysics and, and uh, uh, therapy, they are working on uh, COVID uh, to develop alternative methods to develop uh, uh, vaccines uh, in which you use the beam to uh, devitalize the virus so that you keep the surface of the virus intact and you make it very recognizable, but you have destroyed the DNA, the, the, the internal structure. And also uh, the uh, development of membranes for high efficiency in filtering, uh, for protection and so on. There are a number of uh, research programs that are aimed at facing the uh, COVID emergency. So you have the ability also to answer to emergencies. But in the end, science is made by brains. And that is something that we are extremely proud of and that will be one of our key functions in society for the future, to be a talent factory, to offer the opportunity to young scientists and young engineers to develop, to learn, to learn to work in an international environment, in an open environment in which you transfer knowledge uh, and between uh, people which have very different backgrounds and uh, allow them to mature and then have an impact in science uh, or technology in industry or in laboratories or in universities all over the world. And this is one of the fundamental functions that we have and that we will continue to have a, a very many uh, of uh, young scientists and engineers from Russian universities and research institutions have uh, worked for longer or shorter periods uh, with us and are uh, now having very important roles in their own laboratories. And I think this exchange of knowledge is a powerful motor and very strong motivation for our work. So construction is going well. We accelerator components keep being delivered and we will start commissioning uh, from 2025 onwards. So in conclusion, this is a unique opportunity for science worldwide. There is a very broad program. I focused it on the universe in the laboratory, but there are exciting science programs of very, uh, broad uh, reach, but also a, a number of very important applications. I could really very briefly mention them, but the impact on medicine and technology of a, of a, a development like this is enormous. And what we are doing now is that we are using whatever is already ready to start experiments, which are called fair phase zero. So while we are completing the construction of the new laboratory, we start doing experiments. And this is actually a very exciting time because already we start harvesting before even the construction is, is complete. I remind you that there is a, not a participation from Russia. Russia is an owner of this laboratory, is the second largest owner after Germany, and as a leading function in uh, the conception of the program and in its uh, realization. And of course, we'll be, have a leading role in taking results home and uh, 
this will be, of course, a golden opportunity for young scientists and engineers. So with this, I thank you. And uh, it's, I hope this was uh, uh, not too fast, but uh, I really wanted to give you a broad view of what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paola. It was great. It was really great. Uh, you did. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I hope that uh, your presentation will be available uh, for the audience uh, to get this um, uh, presentation, uh, the copy of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Marina, пожалуйста, сделайте так, чтобы эта замечательная презентация была доступна для. Please make sure that this presentation is available to everyone who wants to get this remarkable information about about the outstanding experiment. It's a really outstanding experiment. I think uh, it will benefit, uh, benefit us all. Thank you. Yeah. It could be some someone uh, someone might have might have questions. Boris, da, yes. Uh, hello. No questions. There will be no questions out of the chat today. Marina, was I talking too fast? No, no, it was right tempo. <laughs> no questions. Хорошо, Paola, uh, in behalf of the whole audience, uh, we thank you very much for this uh, outstanding lecture. It's I really impressive, uh, <laughs> the science, the progress of the project. And uh, all of us, we are wishing to you personally and your team and all the staff of the laboratory, great success and uh, commissioning of the fair facility at the right time. Many thanks and uh, thank best wishes to you. Good health. Thank you to you and to the audience. It's always a pleasure. It's unfortunate that we could not do this in person, but hopefully next year we will be again uh, in person and be able to talk again. Paola, and uh, uh, great uh, request to you. How uh, people get, uh, can get uh, the copy of your presentation? Oh, I can send it. I mean, if they can write to me, I don't know. Uh, it's a bit big, so I will have to ask uh, um, Klaus Dieter to put it on a website so that Very it can good. be downloaded because uh, to uh, send it via email is uh, probably too big. Okay, then please. Or I can uh, make a, a, a PDF version actually. Yeah, uh, please let me know. Let me know uh, the <clears throat> address uh, of. Uh, yeah, or, or a PDF version that could be, that I think can be sent via email probably. Yeah, I can please try. send it to me. I will distribute it. Thank you okay, very much. I send it to you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All the best and goodbye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you bye so bye. much.